Hey, welcome back. Um, this one's for Jazz. Uh, Jazz, you've been a good friend <laughs> for some time. And you've sent me more than one and communicate me, with me quite frequently on the comments. And, and uh, it's been fun connecting with you. And this is one that's been sitting there for a very long time. And maybe some others that I haven't answered yet. If you feel like <laughs> I skipped something that you brought up, uh, remind me of it. Um, but I'm going to just enjoy this. And this is a um, this is a kind of a question that comes up frequently. Students, when I tell them to blur their eyes. <laughs> By the way, this you see that this is Monet. Um, it's about impressionism, but on the question of Monet and myopia, nearsightedness, and uh, <clears throat> but it comes up quite a lot. Students, I'll tell them to blur their eyes, and they'll start painting blurry as if I wanted them to make a blurry thing, right? But one of the things impressionists know they're a couple different things. By the way, remember that an impressionist, you're talking about a, when you're, with your question, you're talking about a, 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 a uh, typically something closer to a, a um, Surratt, a Monet, a French impressionist. But that was more typical. I'll show you some of those pictures. Anyway, let's read your question. You're, you make a speculation. Monet had poor eyesight and skipped the details because he couldn't see the details to obsess on them. If you want to paint in a more impressionist style, take your glasses off to do it. You'll only be able to focus on the big shapes, big ideas, and color relations, and you won't futz with all the details. You know, I, I actually, having heard you say that, I, <laughs> I took my glasses off, and I could see so little. Now, I don't know what level of nearsightedness um, some of you guys have, but my eyes are seriously off without glasses, and I can't see the difference between edges, even when they're really precise, if you see from across the room. So, and I also can't see color quality um, without without glasses. I can't see the, the varieties of colors that are in a given area. It just takes on this big general hue, which you might be arguing would be a thing you can talk about, big shapes, big ideas, and color relations. But I haven't found that's a good substitute. For example, a life in the color isn't there when my, with my eyes. So just, we'll just have some discussions about this. Um, you all can mess with that yourself. Um, uh, a, better, a better thing to do, it probably is to use the blur glass, literally use a uh, magnifying glass and look through it at your field of color and just look right at the glass and see the color play between things. If you can look at the glass and not see it as trying to look through it to be able to see the objects, what hits the screen, uh, will give you uh, um, almost a pictorial flatness. And um, it's really kind of a key to what we do. By the way, the other thing you can talk about is the... Um, is the um, camera obscura, which does effectively that. If you take a lens, I should do that for you guys sometime. If you take a lens, though, like a magnifying glass, and just hold it up to a bright landscape outside um, and let it hit a piece of paper, it will do that. Or if you take a better yet, if you take a convex lens, one of those mirrors, a convex mirror, and you put a piece of, so you have the, you have the light of the day, some something in the, whatever, something with some silhouettes and stuff. You have it bounce off the mirror and you'll have it hit a piece of paper that isn't, doesn't, isn't having bright light, so like a, like a piece of, of uh, foam core or something like that, and you just bounce it off, you'll be able to see the colors on a flat surface. You'll see them as if they were flat. And, um, and again, you won't see little color, but it's pretty crispy. It's pretty, pretty live color. Crispy is the wrong word. Uh, fresh, vibrant, and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, let's look at some pictures just for fun. Uh, we've done a couple relatively dry videos. <laughs> um, all right, so here I'm going to show you and ask if... I, I can tell you that these Monets uh, just tell me that he isn't so near... So if, he's, if he's not wearing glasses, <laughs> he's, not, he's not nearsighted. Um, just the articulation, you can't even see some of the details in an area like this or other places that he's seeing if you're as nearsighted as I am. Everything's a blur and the edges aren't sharp, but this kind of, this kind of articulation tells me he has perfectly good eyes. Uh, he isn't as well trained here as a lot of other painters um, in terms of seeing uh, um, 
leave it at that for now. I mean, like take a guy like Degas, this doesn't even come up at all. But, but even in a one like this one, the um, I can't see any edges on any of these areas. You know, I can't see that. Um, so I'd be guessing about that stake there. So it isn't. That's what. That's not what his issue is. I would. I'm going to suggest to you that that's not what his issue is. But secondly, um, and this, by the way, you know, you want to make that a case where you know, look at look at this. Then look at this. What's he ever say? <laughs> But that, but and so this is actually a lot like the way I see. If you say, if I could even see that much, I, I would be able to see it as a blob with with very inarticulate edges. When the light comes out, I do see edges far better. I'll see with much more articulation. So this could be an example of something that does happen to his eyes. You know, the brighter the light and the greater the contrast, the better it is for the edge seeing. And by the way, if you're uh, myopic, one thing you're doing when you set up still eyes is set up some some decent silhouettes. Right? Don't make your job harder than it needs to be. This, this subtlety, you know, this virtual impossibility of drawing uh, can be very frustrating to think it's all because of your skills and it might simply be because of your eyes. So, but these are examples. But let me just walk you through. There's a couple other impressions you already know about. One is Renoir. And this, so this, again, this is fuzzy fields, blobs. But again, you can see, if you look at certain passages, the guy is not seeing blurry. He's not seeing like a myopic person. Those, he's seeing these things with clarity. He, so you'd say that the spot technique, the, the, um, the, 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 the sort of the field created by blobs, dot, 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 is a search for color. It's a color-oriented search, but it doesn't mean you're nearsighted. In fact, but it is true that one of the things you might want to do is to make sure you see the field as a whole all the time and work with the color exclusively. And I say that, and then, so there are color spots everywhere, and you work that field, work that field. And a, and a, and a spot method, or something closer to a spot method is great. If it's a textural field, the last thing you want is for it to look flat, like a one big smooth green. <laughs> but, uh, and then the next step of that would be to, for you to articulate exactly what happens where this meets this, right? And that's still part of a, a color discussion. But the, you can see at this point, he's a lot more like the Boston School, where he's actually drawing. And these, by the way, I think are both fairly early ones, but he does this continuously. You can see the articulation of this tree's edge and stuff like that. That's not the work of a nearsighted person. And in fact, if you are nearsighted like me, you know you can't see that, that, those kinds of sharpnesses with your glasses off. I know your point, Jazz, is to say that the big things, the big relationships, um, or you could even sort of vaguely imitate but I don't think I've ever seen a, um, I haven't seen much of even these guys, these impressionists, that don't suggest that they actually have their eyes wide open. They're seeing with clarity. Uh, and that, but they're using technique. They're using a methodology of a way of using your eyes. So we think in terms of popping your eyes, right? And um, taking in the whole. And then these, you'll see these fields of color, uh, scattershot sort of blob make, made fields of color. And so this is Surratt, and in the both cases, him and uh, Monet, uh, they're doing something similar. They're bro using broken color, and I understand both of them are in sort of this discussion about how magazines started to do it with the, with the pixels, right? So if you, if you, by the way, if you look at a magazine, if you get one of those really hyper magnifying glasses and look at a magazine, photograph in a magazine or a book, uh, you should be able to find, you'll be able to see these little sets of pixels all aligned to produce the color. Of the field, and so you can see how that's a similar kind of thing that was already working on their minds. There's a conversation like that in the air scientifically. So, but this is Monet, and so there's that look, right? But you still won't get clarity of edges if you have truly blurry eyes. And I'm saying these guys are doing both, which tells me their eyes are open. Uh, I could never see these edges. I could never do it. Um, it's a little bit like night. I mean, even if you have good eyes, at nighttime it's very hard to see edges. That's a lot more like what it's like to be myopic. And by the way, Boston School. This is this is Metcalf, one of the one of the ten guys who painted with the Boston guys at times, or painted it. Was in their same, was in the shows with them, with several other people, Trotman and um, and uh, our, our guys and others. But this is a beautiful example of the Americanization of the thing. But in, even in this case here, so you'd call this impressionistic if you wanted to because of the relative broken color. But the fact is, the field is a textural field. The general impression suggests doing it that way. 
And I mean, one of the things that's always been sort of a little problematical for me is when I'm looking at a sky, a standing out there painting and looking at a sky, and it's not full of broken spots, but it's smooth. While this whole area is textural, and certain other areas even more textural, you know, that's a look that doesn't appeal to me. It's not, it's got a falseness to it. But in the search for color, though, you'll be still having broken color, but you'll be attempting to get that across, that this is basically low texture. In other words, when you change colors in that area, you'll be keeping the same value so that the, the sky continues to look flat, even while you're doing color shifts. But, but Metcalf is a very nice example. If you think about the, um, the um, what are they, the guys in uh, Pennsylvania, I forget what the name of that group is, but there's a bunch of them down there. I'm thinking, uh, is it Reed, um, Garber, some of those guys. You might look at their work, um, uh, but there's a whole body of people that bought into this idea of painting by the blob, I guess you could say, and uh, with that, what, what Jazz is calling that impressionist uh, look. But these are very sweet examples, though. Of, but the Americans actually seem to be intent on pushing it closer to realism, whereas I, I, I suggest to you that, especially in the case of Monet, but probably Seurat as well, those guys were really exploring color on its own terms. And they were, and I'm going to suggest to you, you need to do this when you're laying in a picture. You need to have that first phase when you actually really look at your color, set up your color field before you do any drawing of any kind. And you'll be in the Monet moment. You'll be doing this thing where you're saying, all right, so now if it's just a color problem, what are these colors up to? And then you'll, then you'll gradually bring the drawing to it. Or if you're in the case of the Boston School, you'll bring some drawing shortly, and then you'll go back to doing the same thing plus drawing, the same thing plus drawing, color field plus drawing, right? And um, that's probably the best way I can say it for the moment. But but you can easily see that there's these are guys aren't myopic. It's not what they would be doing, right? The articulation of the branches and all those sorts of things. You wouldn't be able to see that. And uh, so here's the uh, top one is Tarbell, and the bottom one is uh, 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 Frank Benson. But you can see that's what they're doing. This is exploring color almost as it were for its own sake. A lot of non-drawing areas are areas where you could, where if you were a realist, as it were, you would have drawn a whole bunch. But these guys are actually engaging color as the as one of the color and light as the prime. So much so the gamma would say their subject is light, as the prime effort of their industry. So, but you'll still see that these guys aren't. They don't appear in any way to be myopic. It's a thing you may think they are, but I can't see <laughs> even the highlight on a head over here if I'm w with my glasses off. Now, maybe some of you myopic people can, who are just only a little bit that way. Uh, but in any case, I'm just pointing it out to you that these guys, our guys, are actually working on a combination of, of articulated edges that require your eyes and blobs at the same time. And then you find them going down and they can do whatever level of, so this one is a halfway zone by uh, Benson again where you can see that he's very specific about something like the collar and that sort of stuff. That's a seen collar. You're not blurry, you're not fuzzy eyed like you would be if you were actually looking at it truly myopically. And by the way, Jazz, I know you don't mean this. I know you don't mean for me to, I'm just digging into it for a point of a conversation. You're just suggesting it's a way of, it, it is a way of addressing the color field without getting lost in, in, in detail and drawing. And I'm, you're just completely right about that. But, um, but these guys, but you don't need to take off your glasses. Uh, you, on the other hand, take them off. It'll, it'll help you to get this idea across to yourself of color fields without drawing. You do it, whatever it takes, whatever you like. And those, I hear people saying, mentioning things like that, but we don't do it. Uh, we learn to see big, and which means is we learn to see the field as a whole and the relationships of colors. And that search for it requires something like this approach of put a mark or two here and get them going on some other point and get the relationships right between the two, adjusting, adjusting, adjusting to, you know, to the field and to the other colors. So it's just a process that really, really works to incorporate color beautifully. And you can see that these guys have no end of possibilities in terms of articulation. Again, not, don't think for a second that this was done here by a myopic person. <laughs> and again, I'm, so Jazz, don't take me wrong. I apologize if, you, if, if, it, if it comes across and makes you look bad. It's not my intention. Uh, so it doesn't, it shouldn't make you look bad anyway. It doesn't. It's just a good takeoff point. 
and I don't think differently about it. So, but you can see the articulation of the light effect here requires the clarity of the edge. And uh, what I'm saying to you is with my glasses off, I can't see these amazing shifts in here. And I, and I don't get the same uh, chromaticity, shall we say, of the gen even of the general with my glasses off. Things die uh, when my eyes don't, you know, when I'm not taking in the field, the whole field from the distance, uh, you know, with, 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 as it were, clear eyes. My eyes won't go to 20-20, by the way. One of them does, the other one doesn't. Um, but again, you can look at passages where you can see the order in which they're working. So that some areas are less developed than others. Um, that's a, by the way, that's one of those things in our, in our way of working that I would connect directly with the Boston School is that the area of the center of interest is, is evolved earlier and the leading effects are evolved earlier and, and, and there's a level of lostness and that sort of thing that is left frequently because you've already achieved the mission of the big impression and well, what is it that intrigued you about it? So you'd be wrong if you think of these guys as simple realists. They, they aren't that. They are impressionists all the time. But you can see that impressionism, the way we talk about it and the way you see Velasquez doing it, incorporates articulate drawings seen with sharp eyes incorporates it from the very beginning. So a thing like this would be there at the very beginning, even the exit here. And I've shown you, I've shown you the starts. If you haven't seen them yet, look at the other videos. Uh, maybe entitled Lay-Ins, maybe Boston School lay -in, I forget. Excuse me. There's a coffee here for a reason, Paul. Hmm. But you can see the exits here that, Degas, uh, I mean, um, Starbell works on these early and often. Oh, these exits are significant places, and uh, but you know the drawing is 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 worked on. This is this is, there's a pretty precise placement here. If you're doing fuzzy, you won't get that. So I like I like um, the underlying the underlying idea, uh, Jazz. But let's but the but let me just say that the field that we're talking about is an incorporative one. So it's always the color field. You have to discipline yourself to see the color field as if you had myopic <laughs> eyes. And you can just walk away from the drawing. On the other hand, I actually don't recommend that you fill up the entire canvas, no matter how accurately, with color because without drawing. I just You're going to run into troubles you don't need. So that's just in terms of a, in a practice sort of a way. On, and, and then again, on the other hand, I'd giving, giving Jazz the nod, uh, give... Why not? I mean, anything you, you, you might try, try it. Just, just make an effort like he's talking about and let yourself see what, what's there for you, you know. I don't want to make this, I don't make this any kind of a sort of a religious exercise and we must do it this way and the rules and the laws and the, you know, it's not us. I'm just talking about the, what, finding best practices for yourself. And uh, I've not found the best practices are those that I learned from Brackman, where you, the drawing sort of creeps up on you really slow. I incorporate drawing as one of the, and I mean articulation of shape, and, and even light effects where contrasts happen as part of the first lay-in. So there's a color scheme, and then there's power play, and you've seen, my, you've seen my start stuff conversations. So that's a different, that's a different thing. And so with, for the Boston School, it's always everything in the start. But for the purposes of teaching yourself, you're meaning all the horses at once. But for the purposes of teaching yourself to see uh, just the color, why not give Jazz's idea a shot? You know, take off your glasses and see what you see. I want to say one thing I always say about this, and that is that when you're doing it, I possibly wouldn't have been uh, as good a relational painter if I didn't have to be by my nearsightedness, by eye strain, shall we say. And uh, so I've had students who will just simply continue to go zooming in because they've got those kinds of good eyes and they've used everything. It's like, I can touch it, I can lick it, I can hold it. And therefore, why can't I get this? But the field doesn't allow you to, the field recommends itself as first of all, seen flat, which goes totally against the idea of zooming in. Because zooming in, you're touching this and touching this and touching that way back there. Your eyes are always doing this. The field, the creating of a flat field, already suggest a sort of a sense of, <laughs> of short-sightedness, right? So, um, 
but but so I found that the nearsighted person actually has to look over here and over here already to see something, to understand even the depth issues. He has to look around a little bit. He can't get it by zooming in. So if you, as a, as a person with zoom eyes, and your practice is a zoomy, you can actually, you have the benefit actually of using blurriness and poppedness and just, you can walk away from zooming. And, and by the way, those of us who have myopic eyes, we still have to zoom at times. You have to zoom. You have to see specifically what's happening at a point and then see specifically what's happening at another point and actually see how they're doing together. <laughs> these are very specific. These are in the class of zooming. But so there's that element that's always there for you and you're just going to be better at that part. But, um, but what I find is a lot of the guys who have the zoom ability, they'll take an area like where this hat hits the knee and they will refuse to see the unity of that and they'll draw, do a lot of drawing in here that's almost invisible. And they'll do it before it's time because they can. The, 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 the blurring of the eye in our order of things tells you what not to draw right now. And uh, so that, that, that can be a thing. So if, you're thinking like a, if you think like a nearsighted person, you'll say, I won't be able to see that yet. I wouldn't be able to see that. I wouldn't be able to see that. And Jazz has got a good point. Give it a shot. <laughs> I think that covers it. Um, I wondered if there's a, um, let's just wondered if there's a, a second side to this I might be overlooking. Um, yeah, the, you make a point, Jazz. It says you'll only be able to focus on the big shapes. Focus is a funny thing, right, at that point. <laughs> you can't focus like at all. If you're nearsighted, you can't focus. That's the very definition of it. Uh, Except on, if for example, if I, as a reader, I can focus right here. I can read eight inches from my face. That's my focus point. But everything else is out of focus. So what is it, Lynn? Defocus? I mean, uh, Lindsay, defocus? Disfocus? Why do I lose that word? Jazz, thanks. Thanks for this. And I hope you um, get back to me. Um, uh, if there's more to what you, or maybe if you've done anything, by the way in this direction and can talk about what it's done for you. All right, guys, I wish you well. Thank you for your sharing, donating. Um, uh, keep the comments coming and uh, keep on liking, subscribing, getting your friends to do it. Much appreciated. And um, several of you have given some very uh, decent, I mean, decent, all your donations are decent, but I mean, <laughs> A little bit, I could say extravagant donations. Um, and I really have appreciated that in recent days. So, um, all right, I think we're set. Hope you guys have a great week and uh, we'll see you in the next one. We won't see you, will we? <laughs> You'll see me. All right, take care.